Yeah, I guess if you're interviewing and giving a job talk, you should have like a folder that's titled job offers sitting right in your <laughs> <laughs> You know, you want to get people competing against themselves for startup packages. And stuff. <laughs> All right, welcome back. I guess we'll get started. Um, all right, so um, so Brian has just talked to you about sort of the general approach um, of Frapple, and so now I'm going to um, go through uh, an, the analysis um, sort of from the very beginning, um, starting with um, a set of gene trees, and then go through subsampling, um, and then a Frapple analysis itself and then looking at um, results for a pretty simplistic, um, simple uh, simulated data set, but it'll give you an idea of the exact steps um, to take. Um, you'll be taking this afternoon later um, with your own data sets. Um, so, do this. Um, if you could go to that um, folder that you downloaded from the Google Docs page, um, and there is an R script entitled two running Frapple test data sets. Um, so there's actually two copies of this. There's a, um, so open the one that doesn't say cheat, cheat sheet. Um, and I would just open it using the GUI because it'll be easier to sort of keep, we're gonna fill in a script and it'll be easier if you just have the script there so you can see what you've done and go back. Um, and also so you can keep it for your records. But so um, this document is sort of just a, an outline of the steps we're going to take. And I'm going to fill in um, commands. And then you can fill, in, fill them in as well. And we can run them at the same time. Um, but all of the commands are pre-filled out in the document that is also called cheat sheet in case you, you, you fall behind or whatever and you want to refer to um, the commands that we're typing in. So, all right. I'm just gonna make this a little bigger. Okay, so does everyone have that script open? Uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions or, or you know, falls behind. Oh, and also for those who are um, on a PC and we don't have um, Frapple installed. Me for now, if you want to just double up with somebody who has a working installed um, version. Um, and anyway, you have the filled out script, so you can, you can use it later. Um, but for now, you might want to just double up with someone so you can, I don't know, do it together. Maybe let's try. Let's try. Okay, so to um, first thing when you open R, you want to load in the Frapple library, um, and so you do that. You just type library Frapple. Yeah, so I did. And execute, which is um, command enter if you're on a Mac. Um, okay, and that loads in the library, and then you can look at, um, you can get Frapple help. So the main page is library is help equals Frapple. Um, and this takes you to a page that sort of summarizes all of the functions for which there is help information currently. Um, and this, and so these functions, that includes most of the major ones that you're going to be encountering as a user just using Frapple. I mean, there's lots of other functions that are sort of internal. Um, but so using this list, you can go, you can type, you can get help for any function um, by typing question mark and then the name of the function you want information on. So grid search, that's the main um, AIC calculation search for Frapple. If you want information about it, you just type question mark grid search and pulls up the help page for that um, particular function. Um, and it gives you sort of a general description, um, usage, so the options, um, 
that you can call up and pass through the function, and then um, an explanation of the of these um, arguments. Um, so. Okay, so for example, grid search, grid search. Okay, all right, so is that, is everyone up? Okay. Okay, so to start the test run, uh, run first let's just make a, a directory in which to store everything. So create deer, whoops, deer, I'll just call it, Test data. So it's not create deer. Deer create. Sorry. Deer create. Okay. Um, so that will open a. Let's see. That'll open a directory within the current directory. Oops. So you can open that. Okay. Um, and then we can change this to the uh, the, the working directory directory by typing um, set wd test data. Okay. So now we're working within the directory. And then there's a, a data set, an example data set um, stored within the Frapple library. Um, and so you can bring that in to our, let's see, data, and it's called test data. Okay. Okay, so if you type ls, um, double parenthesis, this gives uh, a list of ob these R objects that are in, um, in the test data set. Um, and so this consists of um, five items. There's an assign file, um, which gives the assignments a list of all of the individuals in the data set and assignments of those individuals to populations. Um, there's the migration array, um, which um, Brian talked about earlier, that in, is an array, that in, or a list rather, that includes all of the models, um, which in this case, I guess we can just look at all of these briefly. So let, let's go back to assign file. If you just type it in, Whoops. Um, so in this simulated data set, um, so there's two columns. In the first column, it just gives the name of all the, the samples. In this case, it's just one through 61. And then the population labels is in the second column. And so in this case, there are three populations, A, B, and C, um, to which these individuals are assigned. And then there's this uh, a population D, um, which is the outgroup. Um, and so there's only one sample um, that will be included in all of the subsamples. Yes? What if you don't have an outgroup? Mm -hmm. you write assigned? Um, well, I think um, for now you need to, we need Frapple inputs um, a rooted tree. So you just need to have, you know what? So a midpoint rooted yeah. tree without so. an outgroup would work. Wouldn't it? Data. I mean, if the, if the midpoint rooting is good as a way of rooting a tree, yeah, you can do that. Okay. Yeah, as long as it, yeah, I mean, you don't want to just arbitrarily root, but yeah, you need to correct root it. I don't know if it Where's the assigned file? Okay, so that's the assigned file. And then the migration array. I don't have it. So here, um, so this um, example has uh, yes. six models. <coughs> and you can, you can type length migration array to know the length. Yeah. 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 Um, Creation. And so each one, so it's a list, um, so which, so for each model it starts with a double parenthesis and a number. So this is, so this at the top is model number one, and it includes, so the first matrix is the collapse matrix, um, which gives the, um, the history of collapses. So the first column, so the columns are time events, and the, the rows are populations. So for this top, the collapse matrix, You've got three populations, one, two, three, and, and then the first column, you've got one, one, zero. So that means that you have a collapse event between populations one and two, um, and nothing, no collapse for population three. And then the second column is the second uh, 
coalescent events, and so you have one, so you have um, populations one and three coalescing at the second coalescent event. And two is NA at that point because two and one have already merged. Yeah. So yeah, there's only two populations um, at that time event. Um, and then this multiplier map, NO multiplier map, um, gives the um, population size uh, parameters. So in this case, um, all the numbers are ones, but it's the same thing. So each row is a, is a population and each column is a time event. So population size at time 0.1, they're all ones, so they're all the same. Um, and population sizes at um, time point 0.2 are also the same. They're all the same parameter Just value. And, um, and then here is a migration, the migration array, um, which gives the migration matrices. Um, and so for each time point, um, in this case, you've got a, a, a separate matrix for each time point. So in this case, since there's two time, uh, time periods, you've got two matrices. Um, in the first matrix, you've got all zeros, which means there's no migration uh, among. And it, so in this, this I, I assume most of you know how to read migration matrices, but the rows denote populations and so do the columns and so pair, pairwise migrations. So, the, so migration between one, from one to two is the second column top row. Um, anyway, and so they're all zero in this case, um, which means it's an isolation only model, um, at least for the first coalescent events. And then the second, um, matrix gives migration rates between the historical populations, which there's only two. So there's, there's only two pairwise values. Does that make sense? Anyway, so that's how you sort of read these. So yeah, to access any given model, you can just type, like if I want to look at model number five, then I can just type migration array uh, double brackets five. Whoops, and it'll pull, it'll pull up just that. Um, so this is a list, um, and to get the length, you can just type length migration array. Um, okay. Is, th is this user-friendly enough for you folks? And so one thing we could do, we could write summary functions, and we'll say, oh, I have collapse only, or stuff like that, or you could just read this. So it might be good to to look at that model, to draw a picture of what you think it is, and then we'll have Nathan draw the picture on the board of what it actually is in like a minute. Well, the three D spinning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or we could yeah we could do the three D plot very easily. Um, Nathan, yeah. in the user man manual, there's a figure explaining how to interpret the models. Oh right, I forgot to mention. So also that's a good point. So the, there's a user ma manual also uploaded to that same. Um, directory in which the script you're, you're running. There's a, the Frapple user manual, which is just, our, our Adriana has just updated. Do you have a question? Okay. Um, so yeah, it explains with, often with cartoons, sort of the, the, set, the framework for the <coughs> migration arrays. Do you want to do that? Uh, so this is for migration array five. That's a pretty simple model. That's too easy. Let's do six. <laughs> <laughs> six. Okay. So I don't know if every, everyone wants to take just a minute to see if you can sort of translate this model onto a piece of paper, and then I can make a 3D spinning plot just so you can see um, first translated to a figure. Which model? For one and two, share a color. Six. Then, uh, like one and three collapse. Later on, in the second coalition event. Yeah, one, two, three. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so has everyone got? I think that's what it looks like. Okay, so in this uh, migration array number six, okay. um, so the you have two collapse events. Um, the first is between populations one and two, um, and then in the next time step, you have collapse between 
um, populations one, two is, popula is one ancestral population, and then population three, which is sister to one and two. And then you've got um, all the same um, population sizes, and then you've got um, migration, but the same parameter value um, between everything, all populations, except for um, my, you don't have migration from population two to population one, but you have the, the opposite direction. And then you all, and here means you also have migration between population one, two, the ancestral population, and three. So that what that looks like in a spinning plot is you can exp you can expand it too. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. There we go. So yeah, this has yeah, looks like all of the migration rates, there's migration between all of these populations except for between, um, except for from one to two. Other way. And then it's a fully collapsed model. Boom. Does that make sense? Can you explain again the direction of the gene flow? Uh, <coughs> of the uh, migration array table? Yeah. So... Um, We're looking at all of them. Um, so the way these uh, tables work is, so this gives migration, so it's from the row population to the column population. Um, so these are all NA because, you know, there's no migration from one to one, that makes sense. Um, so this, so from migration from two to one is going to be here, and migration from one to two is yeah. Right here. There's no migration from two to one, but it. Everything so, do the two migration arrays correspond to the time points? Yes. Yes. So, the the first migration array um, only gives migration between the tips, which is <clears throat> the first time event, which is the most recent time period. Um, so, yeah, this gives migration for the populations in the first column of the collapse matrix. And then the second migration array gives migration rates between the populations in the second column of the collapse matrix. Okay. And Nathan, sorry. So to read the collapse matrix, it's column one, two collapses together? Is it? The, uh, in column one, so yeah. the, yep. So yeah, one and two collapse. Oh, and then you look at the second column. Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. yep, and they're always the same parameter. <laughs> Uh, one and two, they have to collapse at the same time period, so, yep. Uh, for that 3D model, oh, we're showing directionality of gene flow. Uh, would it be possible, or do the arrows change with the magnitude of gene flow to show there's more gene yeah, flow? Yeah, there is a, yep, there's a argument that you can pass to this plot function to one. Um, where you can two is um, input one. parameter values, and so it'll make, two is I haven't actually done this, but the arrows get thicker, I assume, yeah. okay. and, uh, and then the columns get deeper, get tricky. It collapse events, get further and further into the past. Right. So for, for the generic model, it just makes up ones that look pretty. Okay. Yep. And will the, uh, the cylinders get thicker with the larger effective population sizes? Yes. yes. Okay. That's, that's really and cool. also they change color. Okay. So you can tell like all so the gray ones are one size, size, all the pink ones are different size. Awesome. Yeah. And you can also input uh, population names. So it doesn't have to be this generic one, one two, three. You can, yeah. two. <laughs> Any other questions? In yes. the collapse matrix, the, the integer one versus zero, can you, like, is it up to two, or three, four? What does the one necessarily mean? Um, yeah, so it, the, the way we use indexes is a little different for collapse. So it can be confusing for collapse um, versus these other, versus um, NO multiplier and migration, in that the value since for each time period, you reset the index value. So there's, so there's always only one estimate of tau uh, for each column or each time period. So the one is just standing in for the up parameter value. If there were, uh, if there were two, but the, 
there never are within a time period you can only have. Like everything either, if it's a polytomy then all three populations would have a value of one um, for the first time period and then there wouldn't be any collapses in the second time period. Binary at that point. Um, yeah, so for each collapse it's always, there's always, you either are all, all, already given a one or assigned a one or a zero. Yeah, it would probably be cleaner and more consistent with everything else to make it the first one always one, the second one always two. Right, right. Because exactly. in general, for like migration, if you have one and two, it could, you know, it's, these all have one rate, these all have a different rate. Right. Yeah, so it's different for collapse, and I can see that being confusing. So, yeah, it might be something we change to make it more clear. Any other questions? So you can see how you could create your own model here using modifying these rather than, rather than relying on us generating all of them. You could just create the five you want if you wanted to. It'd be kind of a pain, but you could. Um, okay. So, oh, so we were still looking at these um, items or objects in the test data set. Okay, so that's the migration array, migration array map which we're not really going to use because it's only used if you um, are doing a heuristic search. But right now, today, um, we're just going to use a grid search. That being said, the way the code is written, you still need to input, uh, generate an input um, as, um, as input a migration array map. But anyway, Brian talked about this, but I'll just show you what it looks like. Watch your case. <laughs> Okay, so this um, just has indices for each of the models. So there's six models, so there's six um, rows. And it just keeps track of the different, um, gives each, each model has its own index signature or something like that. So like the collapse matrix number, like models one and two have the same tree structure. Right, yeah. so the same collapse matrix. So you could, if you want to change one model to another, if you just change that one, it's the same tree structure model, but you could change a different parameter and it would be a different migration rate array. That's what those are for. This is a way of saying, like, if you want to do, like, like one step from one model to another, which, how do I count, count those steps, basically? Okay, another thing that is required to run Frapple is ah, pop assignments. Um, and so this, and again, the, the setup, the way this is used is, is based on a previous way we were running Frapple. But um, essentially, it's a, right now, it's a list um, that gives, and each item in the list is a pop vector. And this basically, um, summarizes the number of populations and the sample size um, of each population that you're going to analyze um, in Frapple. So in this case, there are three populations, and each population has um, three um, samples um, per population. So, um, and the list format is so um, has the functionality to um, for, for subsampling, you could input you know, a list. You could have 555, 444, 333. If you wanted to subsample your data set, five individuals per population, four individuals per population, three. If you wanted to do a bunch of different sam subsampling routines. Um, but typically, we're just going to have one pop vector within that list. Does that make sense? Yes. So let's say uh, my organism's a little harder to get a hold of, and I just have one sample from a population, one mm. individual. Would that be okay? Um, I mean, it would work, but you wouldn't, yeah, I mean, you could do that. You would just use that same subsample every time. Yeah. yeah. So, so, I you mean, you could do like 331. Three, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so these don't necessarily need to be the same. You don't have to subsample each of the same. Um, Okay, and then the last item is a list of trees. Okay, so this is a, an ape object, so you have 10. So in this data set, there's 10 
um, phylogenetic trees, and I showed you the assignments file, so there's 61 individuals in each of these trees um, for three populations plus an outgroup. Um, yeah. Um, and if you wanted to look at any of the trees, you could just type um, trees, double brackets, you know, one, and it gives you the tip labels. Um, I guess you could look at the tree, uh, read, or no, plot, philo, maybe? Yeah. Or, yeah. Trees, one. Oh, we have to load in eight. Yeah. Okay. So um, these are ape functions. You could, you can, you know, look at the tree within our environment if you want. Yeah. Okay. So, so there's the, those are the main import items that you need um, to run Frapple. Okay. So. Um, but, so these are all our, our objects, um, but two of these items, um, the assign file and the trees are, need to be um, read in from a file. So to start um, analyzing these data, we're just gonna convert these um, two objects into files so we can import them. Um, using a uh, Frapple function. Um, and in order to, to export the trees, we need to load in the ape library. So to do that, just like, I already did it, but I'll type it out, right? Very ape. Um, and then to write trees to file is, let's see, write trees, or tree, maybe. Um, So you first type in the objects I want to write, and then the file name will be trees.tre. Okay. Um, and then to write the assignments to a file, we'll write table assign file is the object we want to write, and then the file. Oops. So the default uh, is clade assignments, which, I mean, you can obviously, we can change that, but clade assignments dot text. Um, we also want to make sure it doesn't print quotations. And we don't want row names. Okay. Equal false. So this is all sort of like phylogenetic constraint, if you will. So this stuff, so like the, the Perl script reads these <coughs> and parses the trees and gives us back to Frapple the number of matches. So that's why we're writing these to files. Um, where is the finder? Okay, so now we have, if you look in your uh, directory, your test data directory, now we have a clade assignments file, text file, and a trees file, which are written in NUIC format. Um, okay, so is everybody caught up? Okay. Okay, so the first thing, um, I mean, obviously we need to, you know, collect the data and sequence and um, build trees, um, but assuming we have done that already, um, the first part of the Frapple, um, I guess, workflow is to, to subsample your data set, which are the trees that you're going to be importing, um, analyzing using Frapple. Um, so to do that, there's, um, there's this function called prep subsampling, and we can look by typing prep subsampling. We can look at the help file, um, and so, 
So the main arguments are, so you, uh, you bring in your population assignments file, um, clade assignments, which we just made, and you uh, bring in your trees file, um, and the um, pop assignments file, which gives the number of individuals you want to subsample per population. <coughs> and so you do that by typing prep sub sampling. Um, so subsample path is just the current directory. And since we're already there, we'll, that we can just leave that blank. Um, the assign file, if you named it clade assignments.txt, then we can just use the default. Uh, trees file, the default name is trees.tre. Um, the output file, the default is just observe.tre, so we'll leave that. Uh, pop assignments. So since that doesn't have an argument, we need to type that in. So pop assignments is going to equal um, pop assignments, which we've already defined. It's one of our the objects that we imported with the test data. So we can just type, oops, pop assignments. OK, so that gives the subsampling strategy to use. Um, and then subsamples per gene <coughs> gives the number of iterations um, to do. So how many times do we want to subsample um, in this case, three individuals per population. Um, so we'll just do 10 so it runs relatively quickly. Um, pop or sub samples per pop, no, gene <coughs> equals 10. Okay. And then the, okay, and the other, so. The, the two arguments at the end, um, out group equals true. Um, that means, is there, if true, that means we do have an out group in our data set. Um, and this function identifies an out group, if this is true, as the last um, population in your assignment file. So if you're naming them A, B, C, D, then it's going to read D as the out group. And so it'll go in and it will only subsample, so it will only subsample the out group once, one out group. If you have a bunch of out groups, then it'll just sub it'll randomly subsample one of them each time and it'll do it for each um, subsample. So each subsample you subsample, in this case, three individuals for each population, so that's nine, and then one of the out groups. And so you'll have a 10 um, tip tree. Uh, just to root the tree, and then it'll prune if you, if out group prune equals true, the root from the tree before it prints it out. So you're not really um, importing out group the out group into Frapple. You're just using it to make sure you have rooted subsample trees. If that makes sense. Okay. So we'll just use the default values for those. Okay. So if we execute that. Um, so it outputted. Um, this file called observed.tree, which gives, so it should be, you know, the length of trees, which was 10, times the number of pop times we, iterative times that we subsampled, which was 10. So there's 100 trees. Um, and they each have nine individual trees. Okay. I think the hour is at more, right? Ours is like four. Okay. Check that out. Does that make sense? Okay. So the next step, um, and Brian talked about this, um, there's this weight calculation um, that we need in order to um, calculate um, log likelihoods um, within the um, grid search. Um, and so for this, we this function basically reads in each tree, each subsampled tree, so it re brings in the subsampled um, file, and then for each tree, it basically goes through all possible um, flipping of, of labels within um, the tree, within, uh, I guess, within a population. So if you have, um, if you have um, this, and you've got 
individuals within, so this is one population, and you've got individual one, two, and three, then um, it essentially goes through all possible permutations, which there's three, so you could have one, two, three, three, two, one, or two, three, one, or actually there's six, because ordering matters, right? Yeah, ordering does matter here, so yeah, there's six. Yeah, but, and anyway, so, and then we ask basically the proportion of times that flipping labels gives you the same topology. Um, sort of as an estimate of sort of the, the amount of degeneracy that is within um, a particular gene topology. And we use that to sort of wait later on um, to scale our calculation of log like, like the number of matches. Um, so we basically mul we create a multiplier, so we multiply it by this weight to get the um, likelihood, if that makes sense. So for example, if you think of like a pectinate gene tree, right? If I have, you know, take that pectinate gene tree and then I can, I can only flip the two labels on the cherry at the tip, right, and have the same topology. Any other flipping I do is a different tree. Whereas I have a balanced tree, if it's just a tree of like two clades, you know, they're both cherries, that I can flip this way and this way, it's the same topology. So it calculates that, basically. And so it's gene tree specific, which is slow and annoying. It helps later. Okay, so if we look <coughs> up this function, so the function that does this um, is called get permutations weight permutation weights across subsamples. Catchy. I know. <laughs> not as catchy as Frapple, but not much is. Um, okay, so the major arguments for this, so we'll type get permutation weights across samples. Um, so we bring in pop assignments. Assignments equals pop. Um, the path to the folder, the default is the current directory, so that's fine. Um, the input file is observed to dot tree, so we can just leave that. So we just need this one argument. Okay. And so it is doing the weight calculation for each tree at a time. Um, and this can take some time. So this is only doing it for three individuals per population. But if you increase that to like four individuals per population, running this function will take, you know, perhaps an hour or so. And it also obviously depends on the number of populations. So it can take some time. Um, so, but you only have to do it once. Um, and, uh, that's a, in the big scheme of things, it's not a problem, but it's kind of a pain. Okay, but with three, it, it's already run. So if we look into, whoops. Still calculating. So we look in our directory, so there's a subsampled weights file. And so and it gives, so there's a weight um, for each tree in the subsample file. Okay. Um, okay, so after that we can run the um, calculation of AIC for each model using grid search. Um, okay, so this function has a lot of arguments, but most of them we can just um, use the default values. Um, but this is the function that, you know, you, for each model simulates, you know, however many times we say um, coalescent um, derived trees um, under the particular model and then brings in all of the subsampled observed trees, calculates the number of matches, you know, multiplies the, the weight, um, calculates, sums those up, and gets the total log likelihood for a given model. And it does this across different um, value, parameter values that are within the grid. 
Um, so the grid, um, there's some default values. Um, and right now, those there's, let's see. So the default, the values for the grid are collapse starts are the parameter values for um, the collapse um, events. Um, and so the range is from 0.03 to 15. And if so, if those values don't seem reasonable to you given a particular data set, you can obviously you can go in and change um, those values. But the, the you know the more values there are, the bigger the grid, and the longer it's going to take um, to run the analysis. Uh, the default values for migration array or for migration, are, it's called migration starts, and those values at least the default is point it ranges from 0.1 to 10, and they sort of increase sort of on a log scale, um, which, if, you know, if, again, if that doesn't make sense, you can, you can pose your own values. Um, okay. <coughs> so to run this function, see so type grid search. So we need to import the migration array map. Um, and the migration array, which gives the populate or the models. Migration. So we need to imp uh, we need to list the model range. Um, so this um, argument is so that you can you, you can have a total you know, a migration array that gives all of the models that you want to analyze, but you might not want to analyze them all at once or on one computer. And so if you want to only, you know, run a few of these models, then you can give the range of the models within the migration array. Like if I, if I have six models, which I do, and I only want to run three of them, then I can type model range equals uh, my, uh, one through three, and it'll only run those three models. Um, although to do that, I also need to uh, break up migration array map and migration array as well. So migration array equals migration array um, brackets one colon three, meaning that I'm only migration array equals migration array the first three models. Anyway, if we encounter this this afternoon, um, <coughs> we can go over it. Yeah. So why include, why not just truncate migration array and why not just eliminate the model range argument? Uh, yeah, I mean, I could do it a different way. This was sort of, I don't know. It was the way it was done for various reasons. And um, yeah, it, you could do it that way. But right now, the code is such that you need to declare this model range. But we're going to do all the models, so let's just say one through six. Um, pop assignments. Uh, needs to be declared. Um, so the let's see entries. So that gives the number of tree, coalescent trees to simulate. Um, so the number we've been using uh, is 10,000. Um, and the more trees you simulate, um, the, the longer it takes. I mean, but you pretty much you want to simulate enough that it's not stochastic, like the number of matches. You want to simulate enough so you can get a consistent number of, of uh, matches that can distinguish models, if that makes sense. Um, like if you only simulate like 10 trees, you're not going to probably, you're probably going to get all zeros for your likelihoods and you're not going to be able to distinguish models. If you simulate 10 million, you might get, you know, good separation of models, but it might take, you know, a year or something. So you want to sort of find that optimal value where it's sort of good enough um, to get stable results. Um, 
Anyway, but 10,000 seems to be working pretty well. Although for this, let's just do 1,000 so it runs quickly. And trees equals 1,000. Um, and then... And is that dependent upon how many taxi you have for how many trees? Because the more taxi you have, the more permutations a tree can change. Yep. yep. So what if you had like 100 tax, so would you recommend trimming that down? Yeah, if you, I mean, that's the whole point of the, the subsampling. I mean, if you have 100 taxa, I mean, the number of possible trees is so huge that you, it would be computationally probably, at least now, impossible to simulate enough trees to, to get a match. Um, and so, yeah, if you have 100 trees, you're probably going to want to subsample that down and just you know, have 10 taxon trees and do that 100 times or something. And to get an approximate likelihood value for the whole tree. Okay. And also, I've been thinking about what subsampling is doing. So, if we had that full hundred, then to get a match, you'd have it match per perfectly within a population. You probably don't care about the exact match within a population. So, by the subsampling, it's also matched pretty much between populations, but you're weakening the requirement within populations. Okay, let's use the print results option, which just will update for each simulation cycle. It'll give the no, the AIC value and the parameter estimate or the grid values for a given cycle. So, uh, res so that's result print results equals true, and then finally return all. Being true means you know return all of the um, <coughs> likelihood scores for each uh, grid value. Um, yeah, I think if return all equals false, I don't know if you get anything back. You return the I think we return the vector of AAC scores only. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, you want that to be true. Because that way you can look at the uncertainty in your numerical parameters. Okay, so we'll execute that. And so it's running. So yeah, each one of these is a, a simulation of 10,000 trees and then matching um, for each subsample. And you're you know, calculating likelihood and AIC for each of those. And these are the, these are the values. So this is... Um, time step collapse number one value values. This is collapse number two. And a multiplier is always one because we said we don't care about that. And this gives migration parameters. And if there were two migration parameters, um, then it would have migration one, migration two. And, and that was always one, not because we don't care exactly, but because sort of everything else would be scaled by it. So we set one of them to be one. If you had a second population size, and that could be 0.5 or 2 or whatever. But I mean, with, with MS, everything is scaled by, by population size. And so you have a single population size. Something that I learned yesterday is when you're thinking about the parameterization of the model, the first theta value is doesn't count in that number of free parameters because I guess right. because it's not a free parameter. Yeah. So only if you have two theta values does that eat up. Right. Or if we were estimating theta, then it would be even if we only had one, we could still estimate it. If it was theta. I mean I guess it's the way we use it, it's a scalar. So right. yeah. if, if we estimate that then the collapse tau time is a scalar it's a scale by that too. And so it's mm -hmm. it, it, you can't determine both. Yeah. Actually, Brian, it wouldn't matter whether it's free or not because then everything, if, if, if it counted as a parameter, then all the ASCs would be by two. Okay. So mine has finished running. Is everyone else still running? Still running. So Whose computer's faster? Yeah, on the step above it, the calculating the weights yes. thing, yours seemed to cruise through that. Did you already say what? why mine is doing terribly? I think the problem is 
On the test data that I downloaded, it's four individuals yeah, per population. Yeah, it's four. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I'm on step uh, 19. Right does everyone else have yeah, an IPT? I, I bailed out at step 10. Okay. Because it, yeah. it took step yeah. 10 to get to this. Yeah. Yeah. So a few days ago, the, the version of Frapple Online <coughs> had four subsamples per pop. and updated to three, but our Forge, which is what we use for hosting, builds slowly. So it's still using the previous one. Mm -hmm. If you install from source, it should be OK. Um, in worst case, if you just download it with SVN and then install, like our command install, it'll be fine. But like, in a few days, it'll be <laughs> that version. But, yeah. OK. Sorry about that. Is there an easy way to change that pop size file from yeah. 444 to 333? Yeah, there is, actually. If you just go to the here and type pop assignment equals list C333. Then that'll just redefine it. So you, abort your, you should, so you should abort your current run with control C, do that pop assignment, and then redo, and everything should yeah, yeah. run a lot faster. Yeah, I can wait for you guys to do okay, that. Okay, we yeah, now, there, it's, now it's much faster. Okay. okay. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, my computer isn't obviously that much. I ask if you're on a server or something <laughs> like you. Yours is infinitely faster than mine. Mine finished. Okay. But I mean, all of this is sort of demonstrating that it's not only if you subsample, but the level of subsampling, mm -hmm. you know, that matters. And it's likely that different data sets might have different optimal levels of that. Um, it's not that we really know what they are at this point. So. And if you think if you think of functions you would like that would help you determine stuff like that, let us know. Yeah. So there, I mean, there hasn't been a lot of of sort of look or of exploration of how subsampling influences your ability to do things for file geography. Um, you know, there's one paper about species tree estimation that suggests what is it between three and five subsamples per population is, is like, you know, what, and we base, I guess, what we've done off of that for no other reason than it was something. Is that based on simulation? Yes. So that would assume no migration then, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, you know, I think practical reasons will dictate that you'll need to subsample and you'll need to use relatively small subsamples per population. Right. And in theory, you could you could do three three four and then three four three and then four three three and yeah. Well, it would be interesting to go through and do so this analysis, even though it's not probably enough gene trees. Thank you very much. It took you know a matter of minutes with three subsamples per population and just going up to four. How long do you think it would take, Nathan? Um, for this exact same data set, oh yeah, it might take like a, an hour. So in five, it would probably take a couple of days. Possibly. Yeah, I've never run five. So. In terms of the tree space, the like the three three tree tree space versus the four 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 tree space, the latter is six thousand seven hundred eighty three times bigger. Okay. A lot bigger. Mean that if you write a paper and use Frapple, you can say, "Oh, we didn't need to do very much sampling, so we samples for Frapple." <laughs> 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 no, it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> if I review your paper, I won't have problems. <laughs> I mean, it's you know, Parsons first comms. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a personal communication. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and only sample three populations. <laughs> So is everyone's finished running? Almost. The uh, the um, get permutation things is done, but no, the green search. Okay, it's still going. It's, no, it's it's not working ah. for me. I got a bunch of. So if MS is installed in the right place, or if the Perl script's not installed in the right place, so that's why one of the arguments was yeah, that's um, a good point. MS path and compare Clade's pipe path. And so the reason we put MS in user local bin was that we can just type MS in the command line, it would run MS. Now if you couldn't, if you didn't have permission to do that, if you had to put MS in your own little user bin, user directory or something, you could still do that, but then for us to know where MS is. But one, pass it that. 
What will be the error message if it doesn't find a mess? Uh, so right, right now it probably just give you like... Yeah, yours yours says... Give you good. Mine says MS not found. Mm -hmm. Command not found, so... Mine says something about li some library framework. Yeah, I have the same. Compare clicks by dot pl line blah blah blah. Okay. So, then, well, so that could be then the the commit. So that can't find the other that Perl script properly. Renamed in oh, that issue. Yeah. Oh so, yeah. <laughs> that Perl script by default is in the Frapple Renamed. internal package directory. So every time you install an R package, it creates a little folder somewhere hidden, and inside that hidden folder is the Perl script. But since we have trouble finding your Perl scripts, we can look at that when we break, and I can try to figure out where that is where that is for both of you guys. Yeah. Yeah, so if, yeah, if you're MS, if you haven't placed it in your local bin, um, then wherever that MS is, you can um, pass that path using this um, MS path, or whoops, path argument. So if you just drag it into the folder that you're working directory now, you could just type in MS. Oops. Would be dot slash ms too. If you do. Yeah. Okay. Well, so let's look at the results. So, oh, you know what? I didn't. What is that? I didn't save anything. So one thing you want to do when you're doing the grid search is um, print the output to an object, like result. Oh, yeah, that makes okay. sense. So yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention that. So it's actually, I mean, we can have this summary information here, <coughs> but we can't print it and organize it into a table. Um, so actually, I'm going to rerun it. Um, but yeah, so if you want to be able to save the output from the grid search, then you need to you know, save it while you're running the function, which I guess is obvious in retrospect. <laughs> Are you still having MS issues? So he had an issue where he had hadn't as labeled a sign properly. So it was like, instead of a sign dot text, it was a sign one dot text. Mm -hmm. And so Perl was looking, trying to read a file that didn't exist. And that can cause errors too. I just can't even find where I got it now. He's got it. Yep. <coughs> I don't know where that is. Cooking with gas now. You can do. Uh, okay, whatever. Do uh, What's your problem? Um, get I guess I'm the same. Thing. Uh, yeah, the same. So you guys aren't. It's not reading the Perl script. Though. Yeah. But she said we'll go over. Right. Okay. Yeah. So. What? What? Did yes. Same. No. But he said he. he I'm sorry. Right. So. Okay. Oh. So you guys have the same error? Yeah, same. What did you do? Most of these values are <coughs> doing like 10,000 yes. trees in the search. It's funny yeah. because. So are we getting the, like uh, log likelihoods and IC scores that so are let's do. relatively right here? Oh, you're fine. Do you want to call me the pictures? So you have a, as a sign um, one dot text, not a sign dot text. Yes. Um, yeah, there's another. You can print. There's another option where you can run it where you print actually the number of matches for each locus, which is helpful to sort of see where you're at in that regard. But you could, I mean, you could but explore that using just different numbers of simulation. Mm -hmm. uh, now I guess I'm That's good. Because, I mean, it's defined by the portion of matching, so those values. Right, so if they're all the likelihoods are, you know, pretty small. Or big or whatever. 
close to zero, and then you know that you're not getting very many. In this case, Brian said there were like 6,000 possible trees. Times more, I think he said. From three to four, there's oh, six thousand. The tree space is six thousand oh. times larger, approximately. You want that space? Oh. Does anyone know how what the tree space is for nine tips? You can just do how many in the ape, how many trees nine. I mean, it seems like that would be a good way to decide how many trees you want to decide. Yeah. Oh, oh. No. How many trees? How's there a bunch of trees? So it's hard to just look for a sign dot text, and if you had a Two sign million. one dot text. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that in the eight package? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. I just space blows my mind. Uh, so just with uh, nine tips, it's just two million. <laughs> that should be something we should pass in as an arm. Right, but if you do, if you do twelve, then here, I don't know whatever that number is. Trillion? Is that thirteen trillion? I just stopped. No. Yeah. We're in national debt territory now. <laughs> yeah, thirteen trillion, I think. Yeah, I can't figure so out. So on this, this run That's that you just did again on the grid search, what did you change on it? To when I redid it a second time? Yeah, you put it into a result object. Yeah, yeah. so I can now, the, the results from the function are stored in this um, object called result. Whereas before, I just ran the function, but then I didn't save the results. Hmm. Do you think it's I don't see where you wrote that in. So I just typed in, is that a result? Like right here, result oh, 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 okay. equals I got the output yeah, yeah. from the function. Okay. All right, I got it. So I can just type in result. Ooh, not there, not there. That's not running. You should uh, spit it out. Error. Good. And his and that's what it working on. It was different. Right. That's also why when you add populations, the travel becomes uh, 1230. Yeah. Yeah. Takes so much longer. Yeah. Right? yeah. More populations, probably the smaller you want to sample. They're both using. They're really close. She wants or something. Rather than yeah, and when we were doing the um, regression back on the, that mm -hmm. was a great hope when we were subsampling down to two, so, like the number of matches this. was huge, which means yeah, that's you know, the information yeah. value gets smaller and smaller because everything matches well with the bad models. Not 42 warnings is okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, I should get rid of that. Show what the warnings are. Okay. What are they? It's like no missing something's argument. returning infinity. We're happy with that, right? No, it's well, yeah, I don't think it's, no, I've been meaning to, it's like on my list of things to go fix. <laughs> I just haven't reached it. Okay. But yeah, I don't think it. Is the meaning of life though, so. No non missing arguments. It's possible that. <laughs> yeah, it's like we're calling at some place min migration, like the minimum migration yeah, parameter. Right there. There, yeah, but so I don't think we're using, like, I think this is yeah. part of the code. And the the samples that are saved are not oh, our 444. I mean, we're using it. Oh, so we must start from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Start from the beginning. Oh, okay. so, re so reassign it yeah. to 444 and then. Well, reassign everything to 343 and then run it. It keeps on trying but to I make did this. Really and then you ran the whole script? Or just oh, one? just this part. Okay. Yeah, yeah. One, six. Okay. So you have to write the trees again, right? Yep. I changed it before. <clears throat> it again. Change it up here. Thank you, Frank. I work on health research. <laughs> After just assign one, assign one txt. There's a point in here where we do have assigned a txt. Let me check mine. Goodness gracious, don't. Yeah. Um, to reassign population. In your path. Tell me what? Quickly to reassign to three individuals. Population. I think I have it. Yes. Yeah, clay to Simon's DXT is the only thing I see. So you can do it, but you have to export it. Right here. Bob Simon's um, equals list. Parentheses C. Sign text. Hmm. You do the parentheses C, parentheses. 333. Yep. Did you get that too? <coughs> what? Oh, no, you already got it. Okay. Yeah, I did that. Do I have to do it again? No, no, no. I don't think so. I'll open up one of these. Where's the Ross script? 
<coughs> I think I just copy and paste it from a uh, text runner. Okay, it should be on the text runner. Yeah, no, it's fine. Did it work for you? Population assigned. Oh. Yeah. Is that what you said? Or assignment? Population assigned? Yeah. Population assignment. Oh, that's why. Set a working directory again. Spell the sign. Set WD and then what? No idea why that didn't work beforehand, but the second part's gonna work. So I don't think I have MS in the right place. So I guess I'm having MS is in the wrong place, but I can't seem to get it into the appropriate place through. Don't worry. So what, 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 what one thing we can do? Sigwin. <coughs> and when I wants me to pick it. So our PC is called local bin yeah, as well. I don't know actually. So I'm wondering if there's a different folder. <laughs> but you could so you just drag um, yeah, MS. But, well, yeah. Hopefully you'll know like right, right away. If Working directory. And oh, okay. No, 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 really. And then you do put the argument in your call to grid search. Uh, MS okay. path equals. Yeah. So what I did was I changed my MS path. Oh, you did. Actually, mm -hmm. I think the you default. Know. So yeah. In grid search is the um, current MS path directory. And then so you might just be able to pull MS very, very first into oh. the working direct into that um, grid search folder we've been working from. Okay. And it okay. might just work. Okay. Yeah. All right. I did not. Which for me was just the last kind of yeah. user yeah. slash local slash bin Aren't slash MS. So where, where are those? I guess I have it. Yeah, but... Question. Warning. So at one point, he said they were at our right. studio. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I had a fatal error and I restarted oh, yeah. right as he started talking. Oh. And then I went here and this launched. I can this go here and go to this group. It says, like, oh yeah, you have Rappel installed. Um, and maybe I'm in the. Yeah. Maybe it's because I'm in the working <laughs> directory now. I thought it just installed normally. Um, okay, but if I go here, here so There's like if I type in library, <coughs> well, maybe that was my issue. Do you guys want to see an air off until 7? <laughs> see, I get this sort of stuff. I just realized it was another. Let's try that. On this side, too. What's that? Oh, I got that. Did I bump it or something? And like the grid oh, search won't work. There's a connection on this side, too. Oh. 
Sorry, I didn't realize that. I ended up just looking off this to the grid search worked that time. Usually it doesn't. The help never worked. Just the same thing as, okay. as the, here's the R console, here's where you can find your environments, and here's the whole opening everything. Ah, so you can call functions. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. But you can't do Apple. That worked. So I can try to, yeah. Huh, I don't know why. Some weird things happened. Okay. And then, well, you also did that thing where it went, and I was like, I don't remember what those were, so I ended up okay. stopping, but. But I you can't on a grid search? Mm -mm. We can try it. And I get this weird thing. Let's see. So it was running for a while, or did it just start and then? Oh. Did I not find that? So I remade the operation science yeah. matrix and I re-ran through all those and it ran super quick and then on the And our studio is the same, it's like the same thing. This exactly the same thing. Can you call up the help? Yeah, he so can. It works right now. See, and then like if I do this, like direct create, test data, it's fine, and then it's that working direct, direct create, test data, can't access, can't access it. And there's no typos for that now. So I just went to my office and then... So it's not installing. So how did you, <laughs> did you install it just by install packages? Yeah. Oh, uh, I can show you the exact, because you haven't written up, I did that exact thing. So I got the MS and everything oh, lived there. Um, it's like, I don't know. I cannot pronounce it. I already had that. X, so I already had Perl. So I used it, yeah, with this source. I made this my working directory, and then I did source, installed it, and then typed that. Well, I wonder if it would work better if we, like, installed it through... Go to... Randy. Go to your desktop. No, or do it. It's done. But that's. I'm gonna install that's Frapple like from yeah. our Forge directory. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's done. But why? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but it's does, Yeah. Dude, just sounds very strange. Yeah. Very strange. Oh. Oh yeah. You did that first. Yeah. Before. Yeah. 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 
Folks having trouble. So I also ran into issues so I was trying to call this Perl script. I had gone back to so here for now uh, for individual subsampling. So I redefined the see if it's still um, do we run the whole so they're having trouble just doing this grid search, right? Yes. Yeah, well, I think same. I must not have gone back yes, far enough, yeah. so I need to go back to like. Uh, okay. 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 Um, Thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, is it MS wasn't in the right directory? Oh, yeah. it? And so. What wasn't working? Just that super in search call. Oh, uh, you know what? Okay. I have to, you might have to restart <laughs> I'll it. I'll take care of it. I'll probably start it as a whole. So I'm not entirely sure. So, like, a lot of these things don't work, especially, like, especially running it. What's that? GMS to put MS to the rise of the site. Yeah, yeah, I can get it. Two out. things. Yeah. So um, on the Windows side, I got everything to go except for that last step with the grid so search. Um, oh, okay. Good. Uh, you have an MS problem. You know the problem was yeah, the MS is not. You have the MS, so maybe I can directory. use a little Windows compiled MS. Uh, the question is which directory? Right? <laughs> is this? Oh, okay. Yeah, um, yeah. Or uh, right. I'm, I'm trying to so do it on did, the Linux side now, exactly and I'm getting errors loading the. Okay, so so like. Like some of the dependencies. So there are four that they came optimus, iGraphs, mopter, RGL. So I, I mean, I don't on know. On the Windows side, I was able to download them like, individually. Oh, yeah, might here. yeah they might not. But, uh, yeah, so just lead it to the working directory <laughs> and then put. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's weird because I just got them for Windows. Okay. Uh, you know, when I was over here. Sense. It'd yes. just be like if you were changing directory no, exactly. between like different things, and you just put the backslash between all those. Okay, so I can just type. Anyway, I was able to get them. You said their MS path equals. Yeah, but it, yours well, will be user. It'll be whatever yeah, your. Yeah. Okay. Your name is. Or your computer's. Anyway, they're in here. Yeah. My path. Somewhere. Oh yeah, you should be able to get it from there. Like if you, yeah, exactly. But anyways, I have them on Windows side, but then I don't have. I don't know yeah, if they're. Maybe we should try. I'll go get Well, yeah, that's why I copied and pasted to this and saved it. So okay. When I go to do it again, I won't be like, what? What did I do? Yeah, but I mean, in the real like the path for all the programs. Right. Right. Like modifying that or just including. Yeah, that makes sense. Did that do it? Uh, I think I got something messed up here. I didn't. I can, I can do this one. You know, upside yeah, yeah, yeah. Then I just put them in the same folder as where the car stuff is being. I think. Yeah, it must have been quotes. In R. Looks like I got it. Okay. Cool. Uh, thank you. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, he said it's okay. He said that's fine. Yeah. Okay. It's just something he needs okay. to fix. He said he needs to awesome. remove it or something. And the next was like that was a MS yeah. I'm not mistaken, but then the I thought it was worked directly. So no post. Oh, okay. I got you. So it is no quotes, it looks like it's a variable. Okay. So you could, you could make test data be like. I mean, it's not working. Problems at my house while I'm gone. Yeah, what should I do from there? Figures. Okay, so it should be in, so you should be able to. But you could do this before, right? Why should you download and then why AI Oh, we didn't type. So maybe the path is a way for me to. Okay, and now I can start going through everything. Um, okay. Yeah, so where's the so scripts? Um, yeah, and with all of the R functions. Okay, so then, then just copy this path. The one you're yeah. reading off of. Copy yeah. Exactly that thing. Or, so here's. Then it should maybe work. This is what I was copying from you. Okay, and these were all working until the grid search? Bothered. Yeah, I got up to there. Okay, so these should already be in your 
or whoops. Yeah, they should already be saved. This should work. Mm -hmm. Still in the same work. Box. Okay, so the observe tree is not there. So, where, where are no. we going? Um, Ryan? <coughs> oh, oh, wait, hold on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you want to set what? the working directory? Oh, what file did you open? But well, you can just define it. Uh, set WD. Just a go. Okay, so, um, you downloaded it? Yeah, like that. Okay, so just, uh, open it. <laughs> <laughs> I have one that yeah, looks like that too. Uh, we'll open it with a uh, so text editor then. Only the text my populations of structure. I think that's my my password. Oh really? Yeah. Oh. I don't know if we're pulling it out of there somehow. Maybe it'll work. But <laughs> if those change trees, I don't know. Oh, yeah. Can you drag it? Well, I guess we'll find out. Huh? Yeah. I think we're doing now. Right? Hey, Pixel has the right. You're, oh, you're, yeah. you're okay. Um, do you have the at the bottom? Sometimes it gives the extension. The Here? finder folder. Oops. Uh, this is still a 444 um, trade. I changed it. Uh, actually, what it might be here. Because it keeps going. So, yeah, go uh, uh, down a little bit more. Yeah, I changed that. Did you just be printing anything? Does that represent ten loci? Did you? Um, yeah, it's, it might be a little slow, well, but yeah, it updates it for if every. Did you change, change, did you change, you change it? And then, so this has to be above oh, this. Oh, yeah, because yeah, 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 it's using the old pop assignments. Like it's it's shouldn't be taking that yeah. unless it's back to the finished one of a hundred. Is pop assignments still equal to have two gene trees for the same? It's whatever we installed from that, so it might very well. Did you just reinstall it? No. Yeah. So yeah, you might want to like you take the posterior no. or something of the gene trees. Kill yeah. it. Or, 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 yeah, but then yeah, it's just where it's a blue consensus. Take okay. too long. And then redefine the pop assignments. Okay. That was pop. <laughs> it's okay. Um, capital A. Die. Oh. Yeah, pop and then capital A. Get out of here. I think there's an extra I in there. Okay. Good. Oh, because you loaded again. It's equals l uh, list. Oh, or, uh, sorry, bracket. Bracket. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Here, here, maybe. Sorry. I can't remember. Parenthesis. That's what it's called. Yeah. Parenthesis. Parenthesis. Three, 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 three. Okay. Okay. Now it should run fast. So I want permutations right here. Pop yeah, so the administration is 0.45. No, no, no. So what would you do to okay. fix your problem? Has that um, oh, it does? Yeah. Figure out how our works with working directories. Really one. <laughs> okay. And then there are a few places where I didn't have Still? quotes. And what threw okay. me off is that this so is... I was running it directly um, to MS. You had this in your oh, so library package. Yeah, she needs so to do... So that was working because it was... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, library help equals frapple. It's help package uh, equals frapple. Okay. Yeah. Well, actually, the other way but worked really on mine. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I, I also then moved MS into the um, local directory, so I so should just be able to run it from user notation. notation and take some mine out. Call MS. Or just use, use the default, which is just Python call MS. So if, if from terminal, Python or something. Uh, you open a new yeah, terminal. Yeah. If you type in MS <coughs> and it runs, yeah. then it's no app's executable path. You don't need to specify the path. Oh, so I wouldn't even need to do yeah. that. Oh, OK. I'm just redoing it. Like it's stuff. installed somewhere weird because you don't have pseudo privileges or yeah. something. Yeah. So what do all these yeah. flags mean, do you think? Okay. When you <laughs> make make errors, you get good at debugging. I know that I can change stuff with that, but like, so we have our pop assignment mm -hmm. and the list. What does the C stand yeah. for? So the yeah. C is, it just means I'm Good. concatenating these individual <coughs> items into okay. a vector. So it's just I making a vector. Up, but yeah, that's something with we'll XML. Three threes. Okay. So you could, you know, I could say C three cupcake. Okay. You know, and it'll just concatenate those strings together into a vector. And is this taking any actual pattern? sample data or is this just 100% simulated data? Yeah, these are just simulated. Okay. So if I did one, two, three, would that change anything? Then it would be subsampling. Then your subsample trees, population. Yeah, so first like population would have one sample. Yeah. The second population would have two. Third, have three. Oh, so this is still a So this is, they're all the same size then. So yeah, population so this means one is three, nine population tips, two is three. three. Population. Okay. Yep. Those clade assignments file that we made? Yeah. Uh, 
There's an individual in the population, and if you just say you have three populations, okay. yes. Well, the last it's, one here it's is loaded, and it, it okay. started, and then it so crashed. So you just assign all your. So oh, but it gave me some output. output. Okay, good. So if I only have one output, sure what like you that, did. but it worked. Right there. It should be loaded. Just I installed it. Installed it all over again. Yeah. SVN. Do you know if we, we, we have to have like a full the matrix? Four, like zero point four five all is on, is on for our all forge, genes? and that has a three three three. And the one that they um, built on Sunday is four four four. Especially since you're resampling, I don't think. And so they're building the new one, but it's taking yeah, a while. Yeah, it's also an outgroup, so I guess if you have multiple outgroups. So is this what you got, Stu? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the cluster is yep. four five. So how do you fix that? It's all well, you just said you don't know what he did. Well, he reinstalled it from I SVN. Move on to the yeah. population designation. He went to the right uh -huh. R forge, and it just yeah. grabbed one. I think it's pruned one. anyway, I so it's more just to read it. Stop yeah. because it right. didn't go for a long time. Okay. <laughs> hey, he had the same problem though. Yeah. Reinstall it. Reinstall it. So I need to reinstall it from R forge then. Yeah, I'll, I'll help you. With that. Okay. Using like Cran or okay, I'm gonna move on, even though not everyone necessarily has it. Cran to yeah. play with it, okay. functioning. Okay. And so what happens is they it's a um, they build every so often, so okay. I'm just waiting for the new stuff one to build. Mm -hmm. So if you start from the direct. Okay, so I ran the we can um, grid search, and the object or the results are stored in this result because that's what I um, defined it as result. So you can type it in, and the output consists of, um, I think, four major objects. Um, the first is a list of all of the grids. So there's one grid for every model that I analyzed. Um, and so, so it's a list, so that uh, grid number one is the top, um, and it gives so, and the way the grid works is for every, it does every collapse parameter, well, I guess it's in a weird order. Um, but anyway, it gives, yeah, every possible combination of parameter values for each parameter, and it calculates AIC for each of those parameter values. And this outputs the AIC and then gives those parameter values. And then grid number two is for the second model, but the same thing. And obviously the grid size changes depending on how many parameters you have in the model. So one parameter is just like seven, because that's how many starting grid values um, we passed for migration and collapse. Okay, so there's six of those, because there were six models. Um, the second object is sort of just a summary. If you quit this, all right, you can reload. Um, right. Which gives the best AIC, so the best parameter combination, the top model for each model. So there's as many rows as there are models. So, and so it gives the AIC value for that parameter combination. Um, and then the second column gives you the log likelihood. Um, the third column gives you the the number of parameters, or k, for a given model. And then the fourth column is just like a summary of the which parameters were in a particular model. So the top one has two collapses. Um, but although note that these are not sorted. Yeah, OK. So they're not sorted by AIC. Um, here, but they will be, we can sort them later. Um, okay, then the third object is uh, a um, table of the parameter values um, that were in the best model. So the first are collapse times, or tau, um, and so each row is a model. Um, the first column so tau underscore t1.1, so that's time period number one and the first population. Um, and the top row, so 0.3, was the best value of tau for model number one for the first collapse event. Um, the second column is time 0.1, population number two. Um, and so, and that's going to be the same value because, again, the 
they're sharing the same parameter value. They're collapsing at the same time. Um, column number three is time period one, population three. And then the next three columns are time period two, population one, two, three. Um, okay, so there's six total uh, parameters um, for time for three populations. Um, and then starts the migration parameters, M. So M1 is migration matrix one and then underscore, and then number from migration from population number to population number. So the first migration uh, column is migration matrix number one, or the migration at time period number one between pop from population one to two. Um, and those, it gives the best parameter estimates for each model. Um, and then the next column is migration from one to three. And then the next is from two to one, and it does it for the entire matrix. So there's six values um, for migration matrix number one, and then it starts in with migration matrix number two, like that. And if we had um, population size, then that would also be included in the table. Okay, so there's those parameter values. And then the next um, and final table sort of gives those exact same parameters, but it just gives the whether and which index, whether a parameter was in a particular model. So this is model number one. There was, you know, there was a parameter for tau one and tau two, but not tau three for the first event, uh, collapse event. Um, and anyway, so you, this gives just a summary of which parameters were in the model. Um, whereas, yeah. Anyway, uh, does that make sense, or are there any questions about that? Um, and so, again, if we um, analyzed all of these in chunks. Again, if you're running a huge number of models, like you know, 100 or hundreds of models, then you might want to do it in batches, you know, do 50 models on this computer, 50 on another. Um, and then you can output the results um, to uh, an R object file. And then you can have all, you have all of these results you know, in a particular directory. And then when you're done, you can call all those results together and sort of get a total summary table um, of all of the models. Um, and then calculate and get estimates of um, AIC weights, which you need sort of likelihoods and AICs for all of the models before you can calculate, calculate those values. So I'll just briefly go over how to do that. Um, so we've only done one analysis, but we can save that, the results, of that analysis to an R object file by typing save, uh, no, save, let's see, list um, equals ls, which just means save, whoops, whatever objects are in the current um, work. Uh, and then we give the, a file name file equals, let's call it frapple output <coughs> dot RDA. Okay. So if we look at our uh, directory, it's outputted this um, RDA file, which you can load into R um, just by double clicking on it, or you can, you know, bring bring it in by typing load and then the path to that file. Um, yeah, but anyway, and so that just has all the object, the object, the result object that we were just looking at. Um, and so I can generate an output table um, that calls, um, like I was saying, all the objects from, you know, we only have one file, but if you had a bunch of files, um, it would pull the results from all those files together and make a master table. Um, so to do that, we use this function called concatenate results. Concat um, and so the arguments for this um, are, so you can type an RDA files path, which just gives a path to a directory where it will just 
automatically read in all of the RDA files in that directory and um, call the data into a table. Um, or alternatively, um, with RDA files, um, the next argument you can just have a type in a vector of names of RDA files um, to import. But the default is a local directory, although, yeah, that's, you just have to make sure there aren't other RDA files in the directory or else it'll try and read those in. And if, it, if those aren't re Frapple result files, then it'll give an error. But there's only one, so we don't even need to, um, we'll just use the default of the current directory. Um, out file, um, we have the option of printing this table to uh, like a text file. So we'll say out file equals AIC results.txt. Um, add AIC weights. If true, it'll uh, add to the table um, AIC weights. Um, RMNA parameters equals true says to please just toss out all of the columns. Um, parameter columns for which all the values are RNA, so we don't really need those. So we'll just leave that, those defaults as true and execute. Okay, so there should be a table AIC results. And you can you know, open it with Excel or whatever. Uh. Or whatever open source <laughs> alternative. <laughs> Or the terminal. You could just look at this in the terminal. But anyway, Excel can be useful. And so the top model, so this and this sorts uh, the results by AIC. So the top model is model number two, which is an IM model. Actually, I don't think that was the true model. I think it was an isolation only. But we didn't run, you know, this was a quick, uh, we didn't run very, we didn't uh, simulate very many trees. Um, their results could vary just due to the you know small sample size of the gene trees themselves. Right, right. Yeah. So this is just I made it simple and quick and dirty just so it would run quickly. But anyway, so I mean this gives all of those t table all the information that I showed you um, when we looked at the result object. Um, the thing that it adds, it adds a rank column like the rank of. AIC values, and then this WAI or DAIC is the difference um, between the AIC score of the current model from the best model. So the top, so model number two, DAIC is zero because it's the best model, and everything else is the difference from the top model in AIC score. Um, and then the WAIC gives a model. The, the weight, which can be seen as sort of the probability of a model being true, something like that. So in this case, model two is uh, the best model, and we, you know, have ninety-six percent sort of confidence in that. Um, yeah, and then everything else I think we've already talked about. Yeah, I don't think it's quite right to think of it as like a confidence and like confidence interval. It's just well, so right. So like the amount of evidence for that model being the best model, but you shouldn't sure. be like, I can now reject the other model or something like that. Yeah, it's not, it's not a probability. It's basically, of the models that you're looking at, right. you know, how much of the, to the total evidence is in favor of this model mm -hmm. versus the others. Right. So. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Okay, so there's that table. Another table you can generate. Um, there's a function called, <coughs> what is it called? Uh, model averages. Check case, probably capital M. I'm not getting it either. Oh. <coughs> Oh no, it's not, sorry. Calculate model averages. Calculate model averages. 
Um, and this function basically just makes a vector of parameter values that are averaged across all of your models um, based on the Akaki weights. So the, mo the models that have some information value in them are going to contribute to an <coughs> estimate of what the weight is. And so in this case, it really won't matter. It'll be pretty much the same. The model averaged parameter values will be very similar to the parameter values of the top model. But um, in a case where you've got, you know, weights like, you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, then you want to sort of take into account, at least potentially, you know, all of the models um, for which are contributing sort of information value. Take into account, let all of those inform our estimate of what the parameter values should be. Anyway, so that's what this function does. It generates a table of those values. Um, okay, so count. And the arguments so I think total data no should it be model weights or averages oh good point um probably averages yeah sorry Um, and then the input is actually, I think, this table. So, or here, we'll just run, rerun this. I keep forgetting to define total data equals concatenate results. So we'll run that again to get the table. And then we have, which we've defined to be total data. And then that will be our input or calculate model averages. Um, so. Yeah. Okay, so that's the default. The, the default is just to call it total data. And parm start call is just the column number in which the parameters within that table begin. Um, so in this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the ninth column, uh, which I think is the default, actually. So no, default is ten. Did I count wrong? Let's see. One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine. Hmm. Oh, it couldn't find total data. Hmm. Right. Pass, oh. Yeah. Nothing. I was going to say that he'd been putting all that in there. Yeah. Okay. So there it is. So it basically gives you the same table of parameters, but you only have one row because it's just summarizing um, our estimate of parameters across all the models. Um, so the best estimate for tau is about one, which I think was a simulated value. So how, for something like tau, where half of the models don't have a value for like tau to the one? Yeah, so I think there's different ways. In that case. So I think those are being treated as zero, which I think that doesn't have that parameter. Yeah, because if that has a heavy, if, there, if, if a model that doesn't include a tau parameter in it, it has a high weight, then that should count towards yeah, zero is our best estimate for the parameter value for that. Wouldn't it be infinite, actually? I think we should, because if, if they don't collapse, then one is a collapse point. That's way long ago. 
I mean, it's hard to average zero. Yeah. But I mean, I think there's a debate what how to treat like this particular instance, and I I, I think Bernard and Anderson recommended to do it like this way, but I'm sure you could come up with arguments. That was, that was, but there, I mean, that was with their models. We have like yeah, factors. it might not make sense in the case with collapse. You're right. Yeah. yeah. So that might be true. And migration makes sense, clearly. If you have no migration, then zero is a good estimate. Right, so we could change this so we could calculate it a couple ways. Um, or obviously you can calculate it from the table yourself in a way that you think is appropriate, right? Well, well um, yeah, I, I just, um, I mean, I, I think that in the case of tau, it seems a little strange. I agree. I agree. You might instead want to just say, you know, 40% 40, 40 of the models had this tau. And the, the average for those 40% is x. And 6% of them all had no tile there. And so, what would you guys want as users? What would you folks want as users? So you have some models that have a tile, some models that don't have a tile. So let's say the model average result is x. Do you want it to be for just the models that have that tile? Do you want me to, do you want us to just tell you the proportion of models that have tau, and of those, what the tau is. But what if you had tau? What if you had a case where you know all of the top mod, all the weight went to models, there was no tau? Then what would your value for tau, your model average value for tau, be? Na. Okay. I mean, it's only really an issue in the case where you had a lot of support for two very different models that had different sets of parameters included. <coughs> Yeah. Okay, so then we can use the plotting function um, to print out a rotating tree of the best model, which I think we already did this, but what the heck. Plot model migration individual. <coughs> Okay. And there it is. Beautiful. Mm. And uh, if you want, you can save it to a file using uh, a function. Let's see, save movie. And save movie, I think, requires either image graphics or uh, image magic or no. graphics magic installed on your computer. Um, there's other ways of making movies from within R, but this uses the animation package. Total revolutions, duration, and then where to save it. So. Dear equals current directory. Oh, that didn't work. It wants to create a new directory. Uh, okay. Oh, do I just leave that blank? I just make it movie, like dot slash movie. Or but you have to give the name too. I think so. Okay. Okay. And then I can open that directory and look. So it creates a directory. It creates a whole bunch of PNGs that then compresses yeah. into a movie. Okay. So there it is. No, it's so not. yeah, we can bring that into a PowerPoint, and it will be rotating. It's not there. That's that's, a, that's an error one. Go into the movie folder. Oh. Yeah. That's oh, it. that's it. Okay. Okay. I don't know what happens if you double click that. It opens it. It'll show you each frame, together. but if you put it into like oh, QuickTime or a website or something, it'll be a dynamic GIF. So it's not gonna work. We have to open it with. Uh... Yeah. All right. So that's basically the the, the basic workflow for Frapple. Um, I'm sure we'll hit more snags when you're importing your actual data. 
So first off, we want to talk a little bit about how you filter models. Okay? And so I've put into our shared drive um, here's it, uh, Laply filtering. You can look at that. And so you can run through a few steps. You can see what's happening. Um, so first, 